I'm about to share with you folks a fact that some of you may have a hard time wrapping your heads around, so bear with me here. Believe it or not, both of my best friends happen to be tattoo artists. I know, I know, who could have seen that coming? And both of them have inventories of ink supplies that they want to improve the organization and storage of. And that's what we're going to do in this video. We are going to design and produce a new storage system for their inks, and maybe you folks could pick up some stuff you could use in your own organization projects. So let's get to it. As with any project where we're gonna create something that doesn't exist previously and we have something we need to design around, the first thing I'm gonna start with is measuring up the objects that I'm working with. Thankfully, Ruby was able to provide me a cross sample of the different ink bottles that she uses, the different sizes and shapes that they are. are. Also, luckily, both artists use primarily the same brands of ink, or the different brands seem to source from the same bottle companies at the very least, which makes this much easier. The bottles I have to work around are a half ounce, a one ounce, two ounce, a square two ounce, a four ounce, and an eight ounce bottle. The other part of the measuring equation is where the inks are going to be stored in our new organization system. Now, Houndstooth Tattoo, where both artists work at here in Philadelphia, has this wooden and kind of warm pub feel to it, and they use secretary desks as their tattoo stations. These are old vintage things, so each one's a little bit different in size, so I will have to measure each of them individually, but I need to measure the size of the shelves that are within these units so I know what space constraints I have. Now with all those details in mind, I can move forward with the design process. Before we get too deep into the design, let's talk about this video sponsor, Brilliant.org. Are you interested in making decisions based on data? Curious about the impending robot uprising? Well, there's a free and interactive way to get started in these topics and more. Brilliant is your online learning platform for mastering subjects through fun, interactive problem solving. Take their course on large language models, AKA AI. You'll learn about spotting AI generated content versus human generated works. See how statistics and probability are used to predict conversations and outcomes, and how all of this and more is applied to building a large language model. What sets Brilliant apart is its adaptive learning. After a quick quiz, Brilliant tailors its courses to your skill level, so you can explore at your own pace and build a strong foundation in topics that interest you. For someone like me, this gamification and immersion of learning is proven to produce better results. With Brilliant, you're applying what you learn, making your study time count. Are you ready to jump in and get learning? Well, head to the link brilliant.org slash mandicreally and you can get a free 30 day trial. And the first 200 viewers who follow that link will get 20% off an annual subscription. Transform your learning experience today by following the link brilliant.org slash mandicreally. Now let's get into this design. Now in full transparency, I've already designed these parts. I've actually already printed them as well. So we'll get this all assembled before the end of this video. This isn't gonna be a full beginning to end design process, but I will give you some tips and tricks that I used in this that might help you get your projects done better and faster. Whenever I'm designing around a real world object, something that I'm gonna have to fit my parts to, I like to have a 3D model of that object if at all possible. The reason for this is that Measurements, however wonderful they are to have and important to the process, they start to become just numbers after a little while, whether it just be on the paper or in CAD software. One millimeter can feel like a mile sometimes, when in real world, it's not. So having an object to work around keeps the scale of things in mind a lot better. Now I could spend time modeling up my own bottles to work around, but instead I jumped online real quick just to see if I could find any existing 3D models of bottles like this or specifically tattoo ink bottles. And sure enough, on one of my favorite resources for this exact purpose, finding existing 3D models, grabcad.com came in clutch. And here is an existing bottle design. I was able to download this, pull it into Fusion 360, and now I have a model to work off of. The only problem is it doesn't match the dimensions of the bottle that I wanna design around. Now, four out of the five bottles that I'm working with have really similar diameter dimensions. So what I'm gonna do is take the largest of those four, the four ounce bottle, and design my entire system around that. Then I can just make adapters or spacers to use the smaller bottles in the same system. As far as that one outlier, the larger eight ounce bottle, that's gonna have to be in its own thing because it just won't fit neatly into a package that would allow for holding a bunch of the smaller bottles. 
So I'm gonna show you a trick how I can turn this smaller bottle into the bigger bottle and not waste a bunch of time remodeling things. But we are gonna do this precisely to the exact size that we want. We're not gonna guess and go, oh, is this kind of the right size? No, 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 none of that. I have the dimensions that I measured off of the bottles written down in my notebook, but I'm going to show you in CAD real quick so you can see it in this video. Measuring the diameter of my larger bottle, it is 38.2 millimeter. Now I need to make note of that. A quick bonus tip for you folks here, the way I keep track of measurements while I'm working in CAD is to use the Windows calculator. I'll punch in 38.2 millimeter and I'll just hit enter. Now in the history, I've got that number saved. I can now measure the diameter of the smaller bottle. I need to know the size of the two different objects that I'm trying to scale from to. The smaller one is 29.4 millimeter. Now we're ready to use the scale tool. And what we're gonna do is select the object we wanna scale, in this case, the smaller one. And in the scale factor section, we're actually gonna do a math formula. We're going to tell Fusion what to scale based off of a formula. In this case, we're gonna put in our new diameter, 38.2 millimeter, and then a forward slash to tell it to divide by our old diameter, 29.4 millimeter. And now, boom, hit okay. And these two bottles are now the same diameter. Now these are the same diameter, but they are not the same height. They're not as tall as one another. So now we need to scale one more time. Now, once again, of course, I want to use the scale tool. I'll select the smaller bottle, but I don't want to do a uniform scale because when it makes it taller, it will also make the bottle wider, which will ruin our diameter. So I want a non-uniform scale. Now, if you're not sure which dimension you need to adjust, in this particular case, it's the z-axis. What I'll do is just grab one of these arrows in the design and start scaling. And you'll see which number in the scale field changes. Zero that back out to one. And now I know that I need to mess with the z-axis. Now, once again, I need to do my formula. I put in the new dimension I want this thing to be, 118.75, divided by my old dimension, which is 80.5578, Hit enter, and now our bottles are the same height. This cap is totally screwed up and wonky. That's a separate subject. What I did when I actually made this bottle that I'm working with is I actually split the cap off of it because I wanted that to remain the same diameter. Split that into its own body, and then I could resize that separately and put it onto the bottle to give me the bottle I'm actually working with. You can also scale things down using this exact same method. You just reverse the formula, putting your smaller dimension first divided by your larger dimension, and that will give you a shrink. I do have a couple other design elements that I wanna show you, but I'm gonna show you on my final design. Here it is, the honeycomb from hell. I went with hexagons for the final shape because it's the most efficient design that I could go with. I have round bottles, and remember I have that square bottle shape that's gotta fit in here too. So this fits both of those very well, as well as reducing print time and print material used because of the thinner walls between each section. It's just a very efficient use of space. Go figure. Maybe nature's onto something. The reasoning for the modular nature of it is just so I could fit it on print beds and also expand it if necessary. The middle section is the biggest one and that's still size that it could fit on a 300 millimeter bed. So not every machine by any means, but a few that I have anyway. I also made a smaller piece that can go in there as well. So the similar dimensions and same quantity of bottles can be achieved or even more because you could just keep printing those middle sections and that could be printed on an Ender 3. Now let's dive into this thing and take a closer look at a few elements of this design that I think will be quick design tips for you. Something that I personally feel doesn't get discussed enough when designing for 3D printing is 3D printers. What I mean by this is actually the parameters you intend to use with the design. Personally, I am always thinking in extrusion widths and layer heights when I'm designing parts. Such as if I look at the hex here, if I measure from the inside of one wall to the inside of the next wall over, it's 3.15 millimeters. The reason for that is the extrusion width that I primarily use on most of my machines is 0.45 millimeter. 
with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle anyway. 0.45 times seven is 3.15 millimeter. So I am thinking in multiples of that extrusion width. Now I'm only intending to use three perimeters on this design. So that's a total of six when you count the two opposite walls, meaning there is one extrusion width worth of infill in between those. But I am thinking about that when I'm designing. Here today, this isn't as big of a problem as it used to be. We now have the arachne slicing profiles, which can actually compensate for extrusion with inconsistencies, but I far too often see designs where a wall is too thin or an odd width that doesn't really allow for a proper number of perimeters in a section. As far as layer height is concerned, there's a couple of places where I take this into account, like this chamfer on the edge of the part that I want to give just a slightly softer edge to it is 2.24 millimeter tall. I designed these parts to be printed with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle and a 0.28 millimeter layer height. We don't need a 0.2 millimeter here. Pushing it so it can get done a little bit faster just makes sense. That 0.28 times 8 is 2.24 millimeters. When I'm creating the overall height of an object, the depth of a hole, the distance of a chamfer, I am thinking in layer heights. If it's 0.2 that I'm aiming for, I'll do 0.2 times four or whatever. I will divide my dimensions that I'm trying to work with by layer heights because the slicer is going to do that. It will change the dimensions of your design to fit the layer height that you choose. So you might as well design to that so you're getting accurate dimensions that you intended. I think that's it for the design tips that I wanted to cover in this video. So I've got my complete design and I then sent it to 3D printing. I printed the parts on my Voron 2.4. my Bamboo X1, and the Chidi X-Max 3. And then after quite a bit of 3D printing, I have my final components that I get to put together. Now, I do have to put a couple of heat press inserts into these because I had to come up with some way to attach the sections together. That's of course as simple as taking out my heat press insert, putting it into the hole, firing up the soldering iron, and pressing it in. Now between print failures and successes, I went through about five and a half kilograms of filament on this project. I tried to keep the material requirement down on this, but they're just big. There's no way around that fact. Luckily, a while ago, I ordered a case of Elegoo Black PLA off of their website. It is a steal at $109.99 for a 10 kilogram pack of them. Now, it took a long time for that to come in. It was somewhere around two to almost three months after I ordered before it arrived, but it's been sitting on the shelf for a while, and here was a great project to use that stuff and not spend a ton on filament. I can say I'm not 100% sold on the quality of this filament though. Like these two parts here were both printed on my Voron 2.4 using the exact same slicer settings, and they printed differently. The earlier one that I did, which was a different spool than the later one, printed better. It seems like maybe there's a bit of a consistency issue with these spools. I have not tested this in depth to say for sure. It could be something wrong with my machine, but I'm seeing definitely some layer inconsistency up the Z axis and even a little bit of almost layer splitting in this worst print. But for the price of this material and for the fact that you're only really gonna see the face of these when they're on the shelf where they're going, I'm not that worried about it. And I would probably buy this stuff again for projects like this where it's not critical to have the best print quality I can possibly get. Let's get this thing put together and I can show you the last design elements that I need and we can go put this in place with the inks in it. On the back side of the rack, there is a tie piece toward the top that just bridges across from one piece to the next and screws into the plastic. This didn't use heat press inserts because there's just not enough material on the other side of this to put a heat press insert into. And holding the two sections together on the front side, there is a countersunk screw that goes from the inside of one wall into the base of the next side. 
And a little while later, we have our fully assembled racks. This one here is a little wider, and this is for Ruby because it has these smaller modular sections in its design. The other one is for Evan, and I actually kind of designed this specifically with this larger middle section for him because of a design element that he wants. You see, Evan is one of the owners of Houndstooth Tattoo. He and I built that studio together, and he was very much the driving force of the aesthetic of the space. So the warm wood that it has, well, he doesn't want a black hunk of plastic for a rack in his station. He wants wood to match the rest of the place. So I loaded up a piece of three millimeter basswood into my X-Tool P2 CO2 laser. I engraved the Houndstooth logos onto it. Then I cut the pattern of this rack into the wood. And a surprisingly short time later, I have a wooden face to go onto here. And here it is with the wood installed on the face of it. It does need to be sanded and stained yet. That is gonna be Evan's responsibility because I need to get this video out. With that, let's go install these in Houndstooth Tattoo. Installation was as simple as taking down all the old ink, putting the rack on the shelf it's gonna live on, and loading it full of the massive amount of ink that both Ruby and Evan have. I'm definitely gonna have to make more of these for them. I underestimated how much ink they have, which is silly because I have a ton of filament. I should have gotten that. Now on Ruby's rack especially, there's a fair bit of space around each of the bottles. This is because Evan has some bottles that are larger than hers, and I wanted to make a one size fits all kind of solution. So this also allowed us to easily remove the smaller bottles from the rack. I did print some spacer pieces that went in there that would push the bottles a little further out so they'd be easier to grab, but both Evan and I agreed they weren't necessary because there was enough room in there with the smaller bottles to be able to still reach in and pull them out of there. And if I do say so myself, I know Ruby agrees, I think they turned out pretty good looking. That's gonna wrap it up for this one. Folks, I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, maybe you'll enjoy this video where I made a part for a client with the Cheaty X Max and gave some more design tips in there as well, or this video that YouTube thinks is best for you. Catch you in the next one, folks. Thank you